Brother Rodney just gave you the reality of how you how things go in the ministry. I was uh, I went to a school that all they talked about was numbers. And I went to a small country town. I'm a farm kid. I'm a very quiet individual. I'm an introvert. I had an uncle that was a hermit. I could do that as long as with my family. I rarely travel. And if I do travel by myself, I usually get homesick and go back after two days. <laughs> uh, that's just my nature, the way I am. And I was in Rensselaer for many years, uh, six, seven, eight years. And uh, you know, when you're in a small town, country folk, all the little gimmicks and gadgets don't work. And so it's like, Lord, who am I? I'm an idiot. I'm a punk. Ain't doing anything. This is a joke. And for encouragement, I walk in a cemetery and came across the tombstone that said, he that is faithful in least is faithful in much. Somebody put that on a tombstone in the 1800s. And I said, I got it. I got it, Lord. Amen. If you want me to live and die here in this small little town, this small community, I'm going to do it. And I'm still there. Amen. The Lord just happened to add a second church. And so I've been doing two churches now for 24 and a half years. So if I keep going till I'm 70, I will have 70 years of pastoral experience putting both churches together. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's how that works out. So... Uh, Mark 10, 42, and then Luke 22. <clears throat> You'll see that these are parallel passages, and there's also one in Matthew. So when the Bible repeats something like this, uh, it must be a major issue. Right. Jesus called them unto him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke 22. Luke 22. Okay, verse 21. I'm sorry, we'll drop down to 24 to paragraph Mark. It says, And there was also a strife among them, that's the apostles, which of them should be accounted the greatest? What is the only criteria that you could try to figure that out? Spirituality? You can't measure that. What is the only thing that man would consider who's the greatest? Can't be spirituality, can't be pride, can't be anything spiritual. The only thing it can be is numbers. Who's got the most numbers? They got a greater work. If that's the case, the Pope's got us all beat. That, that's human nature right there. And the school I went to, that's all they talked about. Okay, and so you, you go to a small town, you don't get those things. Oh, I had those things. I knew how to get them. I mean, uh, we packed 195 in the church building and swallowed a goldfish that day. Had a bus route. And uh, then the bus engine blew up, and I'm like, okay. And so you just change. You just change according to God. So then verse 25, he said, He said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise their lordship over them. 
and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. So uh, I served under two or three pastors, and they all showed me how not to do things. Not how not to treat people. And so this is... This is going to be the idea of this as far as missions goes and, uh, you know, any work that the Lord would put you in. As a Christian, I, I would dare say uh, you are a leader in some way. Okay, what is a leader? Gentiles think it's a bully. That's what they think. You know, the superstar athletes bully the other players. So we're going to use that phrase, the idea. The Gentiles' viewpoint of leadership is similar to a bully. That's really what it is. And because it is so common, people think that that's the way it's supposed to be done. And that's how, in particular, Fundamental Baptists really accent upon it, of uh, being a bully, a strong leader in the church. But they're nothing but bullies. Now, a bully might be right in his goal, but the people's relationship always suffers. Right. Always does. And so the methods of a bully are ingrained in a Gentile uh, culture, and it's like a pecking order of animals. I got chickens back home. I got guineas, chickens, you know, and one chicken a peck on the other one, and I'll whop that chicken and try to quit it to pecking on the other one. That's built in their DNA. Dogs, you get one dog, get a second dog, there'll be a pecking order. Always will be that way. Uh, in our country, they sometimes call the presidency a bully pulpit. They sometimes call it that. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 12, that the kingdom of heaven, heaven operates by violence, and the violent take it by force. Right. Okay, and so uh, this is a common thing that we deal with. Now, as I've mentioned before, being a farm kid, being in Indiana, I play basketball. I was a runt growing up. In fact, they called me Pee Wee. I was 5'2 when I got my permit to drive. Of course, I'd been driving since 12 or 11 on the, on the road, tractors and everything. And Dad would just tell me, if a cop stops, you just tell him what you're doing. Never had a problem. I mean, I'm 4 foot 9 inches tall driving a huge tractor. Uh, I'm driving a grain truck looking through the steering wheel. Uh, but that's just how we're raised on a farm. And so... Uh, very short, so because you're short in basketball, you become the point guard, and the point guard's like the quarterback. He's like the pilot of the team, and so I developed that, and then I grew three inches after high school and all this stuff, and so I played intercollegiate basketball, but I still had those point guard skills, and so now, even today, when I go to a new court to play, I experiment, and what I do is I throw the ball to somebody else, just to see how quick it comes back to me. And three times, usually up and down the court, three times they're throwing it to me wanting me to take charge. Because they recognize something. I don't ask for it, I don't beg it, I don't call for it. It just happens. And I would dare say that is leadership. How do we do that? Okay, most businesses are run by bullies. Okay, um, obviously it must be a problem with pastors because Peter said in 1 Peter 5, neither being lords right. Amen. over them. And then some pastors back in the, in the state, oh, I believe in pastoral authority, I have pastoral authority. And I'm like, what, are you a little insecure or something? <laughs> Uh, and so uh, the home environment usually gravitates toward this, a bully environment. Now, obviously, as parents, you've got to discipline your children. Uh, but a marriage with one bully usually ends in divorce unless one cowers like a dog. Okay, a marriage between two bullies always ends up in divorce. Always does. 
Uh, several years ago, uh, I came across a real live cowboy. He uh, was a missionary for a brief time in Argentina. I don't know if you remember Jeff Adams. We had a, a horse in our area that had never been written, ridden, and Jeff Adams was going to show us, explain to us how to ride a horse, not the usual way, slap the saddle on him, get on him, and buck it, and everything, and all this stuff. He showed an amazing technique, and what he did, it took him an hour and a half, and that horse never reacted negatively towards him. And he got on top of it about an hour and 15 minutes, and the thing just walked off. And what he did for the first 30 minutes is he just spooked that horse through the corral, just spooked it and spooked it and spooked it. And then it says, after 30 minutes, he said, now watch this. That horse is going to be in the corner. It's going to stand in the corner. It's going to look at me. I'm going to walk toward that horse. I'm going to turn around. It's going to follow me. He explained everything what was going to happen. And that horse did exactly what he said. And it followed him right up to the gate. And then he said, okay, now I'm just going to touch this horse. And he'd touch it here and he'd touch it there. And then he'd put a, a blanket on it here. And then he would jump. And then he'd jump off. He'd jump, jump off. And then he'd put his hands over it. Whenever that horse reacted, he jumped off. So that that horse felt secure. I was amazed how he did that. Now, you get on a horse and break it, you're going to have to, you have a, a relationship with the horse that's not, it's, it's broken also, the relationship is. But that horse trusted him. He gently trained that horse in an hour and a half. I was fascinated with that. I thought, I wonder if that would work with people. <laughs> not that I want to ride people. <laughs> But it's really strange. If you would go to Leviticus chapter 6, how often do you get the passage out of Leviticus? And I'll apologize before I even get into this. That I'm going to use government illustrations or governing authorities as an illustration because we kind of all experience that. We all kind of understand that. Okay, in Leviticus chapter 6... Uh, it would be talking about verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, if a soul sin, commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered to him to keep, or in fellowship. Okay, so he lied is one thing, and then in fellowship, or in a thing taken by violence, and hath deceived his neighbor. Notice the last two. Property taken by violence... Or property obtained through deception. That's a sin. Violates the law. Verse 3. Or, or have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it, swearing falsely in any of these that a man doeth sinning therein. Then it shall be because he hath sinned and is guilty. Then he shall restore that which he took violently away or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten or that which was delivered to him to keep or the lost thing which he found two things violence and deceit those are the two techniques of all governing authorities all of them I don't care what you call it okay now Zacchaeus remember when Zacchaeus got saved he came to Christ what did he do? He said, if I took anything, you know, by falsehood, because that's what his profession does. In our country, in uh, the public school, they have what's called a zero tolerance for bullies. But you know how the public school is funded? By bullies. If you own property, you pay property taxes on my house. You know, I've got a log house. I built a log house, cut the trees, built a bark, did everything. And built a garage, built a house, you know, built a cabin, all uh, log st structures. I pay, uh, now it's up to 2000 every year for the property. Uh, that and 70% of that goes to the public school. My wife and I have raised five children. She, we homeschooled them, all of them, never put our kid in a public school. When my son was about nine, I, I was asking, I asked Brent, I said, how would you feel if we put you in a public school? And he said, I would feel unloved. <laughs> I never expected that. 
Now, I've never had, a, we've never put a child in a public school, but we're paying for it. I don't like paying for it. If I don't pay for it, the county sheriff will come and violently take it away from me. That's how it's funded. But they have a zero tolerance for bullies in the school. But it's funded by that. Phenomenal. I mean, it's just how it works. Deception is the preferred method. The least amount of violence is the other choice. Deception is the first. We had a CIA director in 1981, William Casey was his name, and he said this, we know, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Denzel Washington said, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you do watch the news, you're misinformed. Right. Have a good day. Turn off the news. Amen. You can't believe what you think about America from the news industry. Media, media, medium, medium. It's a witchcraft. It's deception. It's designed that way. And so a lot of things are very strange in our country right now. Very weird. What's going on in our country? Before the election, Biden said we have the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in history. He said that a month before the election. And if you go to the White House today, no one is living there. Soldiers are guarding it. It's weird. It's weird in our country. And I'm asking, I'm begging for your prayers for our country because if America, you know, is, goes down the tubes, it's going to affect world missions amazingly. Amen. I mean, I saw a video clip on CNN where Biden company was in the Rose Garden, which is on the White House grounds. And this guy lived in Washington, D.C. And here he is showing a, a, an event in the Rose Garden, but he's looking at the Rose Garden and nobody's in there. The deception in our country is phenomenal. It's just amazing what's happening. You can't believe, if, if the news media reports something, and I don't know anything about it, I believe the opposite. And I'm 99% correct. My son was flying from uh, America to Costa Rica, returning back there last, about a year ago. He's talking, to, a soldier was sitting on the plane close to him. They got chatting. And he said to my son, he said, do you know that we have a Trump army and a Biden army? Which I kind of knew that, but that just kind of confirmed it. Who's in charge? Who did God delegate to be in charge of the world system? Satan. Can't trust him. You see? And so I'm, I'm just saying things are very weird. And beg God... Beg God for your country and our country. Just very strange. And we've seen the last two years the deception that's been pushed out. My brother-in-law, my sister lived in China at the time. They were missionaries in China for 13, 14 years. Uh, about four months before uh, COVID came out, a Chinese official told my brother-in-law, uh, you need to get out of China by February. Because they knew, they had foreknowledge of all this stuff. And so that's just phenomenal to me. But it shows the violence that governing authorities do. We all experience, and again, I apologize for using these examples, but it's our best way to explain it. If a bully perceives herself, usually this is a female's method, if a bully female perceives herself at a disadvantage, she will use manipulation, guilt. Make you feel, oh, I've done, a lot. I, I've done so much for you. You should be doing this. And I just can't believe you won't do that if you don't do this. And I, I can't. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> okay. Um, if the bully perceives himself, and this is usually the male route, uh, to be at the advantage, enforcement through intimidation is the math. He will berate. He will belittle. He will intimidate. He will terrorize. Fear is a tool of control. 
First uh, Timothy, Second Timothy 1, 7, we are not under the spirit of fear, but of love and power and of sign mind. So fear, that's a technique of control. Now, the advantage that a bully has is that he may get his way. He most of the time does get his way. But the disadvantage is they don't know who voluntarily loves them. But a bully don't care. I do. I don't want somebody to be in my fellowship because they feel I'm going to bully them in it or I'm going to manipulate them in it or I'm going to guilt them into it. I want a friend who's voluntary. Amen. Isn't that what God wants? That's right. God wants a voluntary friend. It's phenomenal. You see? And so uh, it's just amazing to me how this works. So these are the two basic approaches. And most pagan gods work in this way. Zeus, you know, and Nike and the god Pan and all these pagan deities. Uh, when the Roman church is in authority, they will bully people. They will terrorize them. It's called the Inquisition. When the Roman church is in the minority, they will manipulate. They will cower just to get in that position. When the Islamic faith is in the majority, they will terrorize their people. When they're in the lower part or enjoying the the financial pleasures of Australia or the United States, they kind of go down, but they don't want to say what they really believe because they're afraid to. I mean, and so uh, th these are methods that are followed. And so we can learn from these things. Uh, if you would look in 2 Timothy chapter 224, I mentioned this last night, but I, I find in, in the Bible a different techniques of personal work. In America, if you get in a discussion, we often get around uh, Purdue University, good old P PU. Uh, we get around there and uh, uh, we try to talk to college kids. And if a college kid wants to get out of the discussion, they'll say, you're racist. <laughs> and they'll walk off like they won the argument. I didn't even say anything. Now, in the Christian world, if they want to get out of the discussion, they'll say, you're a heretic. Amen. You're a rock monite, that's what you am. <laughs> and then they'll walk off like they won the argument. I mean, it's just utterly insane. In our personal work, 2 Timothy 2.24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. Unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth. Now I find there's seven or eight personal, um, personal experiences. I guess you call it personal work, and it's a really interesting technique. Uh, you have Jesus with the rich young ruler. You've got Jesus with Nicodemus. You got Jesus with the woman at the well. You've got Peter with Cornelius. Paul with um, the Ethiopian, no, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then Paul with um, the Philippian jailer. Those are personal works where somebody is personally dealing with an individual. Boy, is it a different technique. Right. Every one of them, every one, the similarity with all of them is if this, the individual is aiming at their conscience. Every one of them. None of them say repent. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying in these experiences. I would have thought when Jesus appeared to Saul, who had been killing his own people, his own children, he would have said, you need to turn or burn, Saul. You need to repent and get baptized. <laughs> I mean, you would have thought he would have gone through all this rigmarole and only thing the Lord says, hey, Saul, how's your conscience? Did your conscience bother you a little bit? You saw how Stephen died. Could you die that way, Saul? And man, that boy, that affected him. Aiming at that conscience is phenomenal. And the Lord will hit that, hit that, hit that. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we... 
there's, there's a time you can say repentance to somebody and there's time you say some of these things and you follow a, a step program. That's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Okay, but yet we got to be flexible with the Lord. I got saved as a nine-year-old kid, farm kid. I don't know who witnessed to me. All I remember is that after I came home from the little country school, I ran up the two uh, the, the long driveway on our farm. I went up to my bedroom, got on my knees, trusted Christ. I have no idea what led up to it. Nobody told me about the doctrine of soteriology. And I mean, they didn't tell me anything. I just knew I needed Jesus Christ. Amen. Nobody followed up on me. Nothing like that. Man, my conscience became alert. My mom became my priest where I was confessing all my sins to my mom. And she thought I was going nuts. <laughs> And my dad was the one that got saved about the same time we were Dutch Reformed. I discovered I wasn't, I was predestinated not to be Calvinist. So, I, you know, I discovered those things <laughs> later on. But these were, I, man, that day, I will never forget that day. I don't know what date it was. I don't know what led up to it. I've tried to figure out. I'm looking forward to get to heaven. Whoever it was that witnessed to me. To give him a great big bear hug. Changed my life forever. You see, nobody scared me into it. Nobody threatened me into it. Nobody guilted me into it. Nobody even said anything about hell to me. Nothing like that. I just knew I needed Jesus Christ. And when you look at those seven different personal works, the four of them with the Lord Jesus, and then you got Philip and Peter and Paul, I would dare say we might, uh, maybe we might discover our family member that we should be a servant to, don't need to be hearing us telling them, you're going to die and go to hell. Maybe we should be serving them, loving them. And when the Lord opens a door to talk to them. I mean, as far as fam family goes, fam oh, family. Uh, I, I pastor the one church. My dad's in my church. My dad and mom's in my church. My big brother's in my church. My sister was in the church for a while. My other sister's in China. And when I became the pastor after six months, my brother's five years older than me. I was just razzing him the other day because he turned 70. I'm hitting 65 in about a month or so. And uh, last year, he let me drive the combine because he had a broken hip. If I'd have known that, I would have kicked him in the hip a long time ago. <laughs> but after being a pastor, I'm his pastor. I told him, I'm still your kid brother. When I come to the farm, I'm Dave. Nothing's changed. Amen. And that's the way it should be. Amen. That's my brother. And so uh, it's amazing to me how people treat people. I just can't imagine how people treat people. Amen. The meanness. Right. Animals treat each other better than a lot of people do. Amen. Now, I recognize there, the, in life, there's the right of the creator or owner who allows it allows them to act or rule according to their wishes. OK, so if somebody owns a business, they can run the business the way they want. And that's their right. But everything will get into a hierarchy. Everything does. All, plant, all animals do. People do. We get into a hierarchy. You've got to find your place in that hierarchy. Okay? And so the family unit has a chain of command. Okay? Children are given life by God and the parents. Parents raise them according to their wishes. Okay? A wise parent will lovingly guide and train his child. But as children grow into adulthood, as they get into those teenage years, those 15 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old, uh, a wise parent adjusts their methods. When my children turn 20 or 18, probably 18 or 20, the boys, when they turn 18 or 20, I looked at them and said, okay, from now on we're equals. I will do my best not to give you unsought advice. Now, I've had 18 years of guiding your changes, so you've got to give me a break. But we're equals. You see, now there's one, one slight variation. If they're under my roof, then there's the chain of command. Okay, they're under my roof, then that's my right. 
Okay, but still, here's the problem with all the in-law jokes. You know why all the in-law jokes is because these parents forget that this is a new family. Whole new family. She didn't join their family. She joined him. And he and her are equal with mom and dads now. And no more of this, my mom made it this way. Or mom comes into her kitchen and says, I, you need to do it this way. No, it's not your kitchen, it's mine. Stay out. Right. You see, in, in, as a grandparent, my wife and I, when we, like here, we're, we put ourselves into Heidi's life. We don't want her running us all over the place. She cleans houses. Guess who's cleaning houses with her? You know, not as much. She's kind of cool on dad, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, we're, we put ourselves in their lives. And we follow the parents' wishes. We don't interject and say, oh, mommy won't let me give you this candy. No, we want to follow their wishes. We had our opportunity. Now we need to do all we can to help them with theirs. And to be a blessing to them. And serve, serve, serve. Today I cleaned her um, caravan. Man, just cleaned all that sap off it and cleaned everything. Why? Because I want to be a servant to, them, to her and the boys. And so this, this is a, as far as a role of life. Now, in some areas of life, it's a voluntary choice. Okay, if you go to a private school or Christian school, you are voluntarily putting yourself under their chain of command. Don't go there and cause problems. If you don't like the situation, leave. Uh, your job... Okay, your job is the owner. You've put yourself voluntarily. If you don't like your relationship, go someplace else. That's a voluntary thing. Uh, sports leagues, you play a sport. You have volunteered to join into that and follow that. Your career, your job. Church attendance is voluntary. You're going to come in here and cause trouble. The hierarchy is going to, they need to stand on that. Okay, if somebody's going to walk in these doors and cause trouble, the pastor and the deacons and leadership said, ah, you're affecting everybody else. Okay, and they don't, and they're not being bullies about it. That's protecting a church. There's a hierarchy. You see, and so an author can write as they choose. A composer can can uh, write to music as they choose. A playwright, my wife writes plays. We've done uh, 20 some plays. And uh, as far as who picks the actors and the actresses in the plays, who does what, it is a, it is a monarchy. She picks, she wrote it. She picks who's doing stuff. Anybody's gonna kind of debate with that? No debates here. That's the hierarchy. And what you learn in life is when you enter into any room, relationship, look to see where you're at in that and be the best you can in that role. I, I, I'm big on age. My father's 90 years old. My father has never one time heard me yell at him, rebuke him, show him a bad attitude. What not? Now, did I have a bad attitude? Yes, I did. But he never saw it. I love my father, my mom and dad. Best parents a person could have. Okay, but I have never one time in a ministry rebuked anybody who's older than I am. Never have. Why? It's a sin to do that. It says in 1 Timothy 5, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. In our culture, America is pathetic on that idea. Just pathetic. Vietnam is overkill, where they worship their ancestors. That's overkill. Okay? Uh, but there's a hierarchy, and we got to recognize this is the problem with emailing and Facebook, because you don't know the age of the other party. See, that's the problem. 
And so these are techniques of leadership that a person should have. If you would look in Titus chapter 2, verse 9. I tell the young people in our church that if they obey these two verses, they will always have a job. Always will. Titus 2, verse 9 and 10. And this is the best way for you to witness to the owners of the job or your foreman, anything, anybody that's over you, any hierarchy that you have at your work, this is the best way for you to witness Titus 2, 9 and 10. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. What's that? Talk, back talking. Keep your mouth shut. Do your job. Not purloining. That's an old English word for theft. Biting the hand that feeds you, you steal from it. Last time we were here, uh, I think it was the time before, Heidi and Simon and I, my wife, were going through all these, and I saw this guy stick two candy bars in his pocket. And I thought, this is going to be fun. And so I, I dogged that guy through the whole place to see if he ever took him out. And I uh, got to the front where we bought the stuff. We had our, you know, our exchange at the front, and I said to the girl behind the counter, I saw a fella stick a couple candy bars in his pocket. Would you want to know who it is? Yes, we do. <laughs> and it says he's right there. And boy, was it fun. Oh, Luke and Simon had most someone. They're watching this. I said, now, don't be staring at the guy. We've got to kind of be cool on this. And so when that guy came through the counter, he paid for all his items. As soon as he pulled out on the, uh, on the trolley, he took it out of his pocket, threw it in the, tr the trolley. I thought, man, that was slick. And the reason why he did that is because they could say, what do you got in your pocket? He's going to say, I got nothing. But they had to let him commit the crime before they can chase him down, and they chased him down. And that dirty dog, you know, owners of these companies will raise the price of an item to cover for that shoplifting. So who's being punished? Honest people. Now, I don't know what they did with that guy. I hope they put him in a pokey for a while. But in Titus 2 verse 10, he says, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Fidelity is a very careful, exact, doing the best you can as if it's doing it for you or doing it for the Lord Jesus. And then notice that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. I tell our young people, when you get that job, you, you show up to work, you keep your mouth shut, you do what you're told, and then maybe the boss someday will say to you, man, you are a good worker, why are you? Well, by chance, I'm glad to tell you that, because the Bible tells me to do that, and I like to tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, they may not want to hear about Jesus Christ, but they sure want to hear that kid is going to work. So, these are ideas, if you would go to Proverbs 29... When I was a little runt, 13 years old, four foot nine inches tall, I was on a detasseling crew. Okay, detasseling of corn, in, in corn you'll have the stalk and then you have a tassel that comes out the pot, top, that's a male portion, and then the silk on the ear, that's the female portion. And so when you pop the top off, then you can cross pollinate. It's like milking a cow upside down. You know, and it's a very tedious job, hot job. It's a good job. I mean, and, and I, a farm kid, I caught on real fast. So they put me over a crew of people, and I'm four foot nine inches tall looking up to these guys. How do I lead these guys? Well, I couldn't boss them around, and I figured it out. I'd got to serve them. And what I did is I did some of their work where they could rest as the machine's going, and then I let them go, and then that next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy. And I kind of figured out how that worked. In Proverbs 29, if you look at verse 15, 17, 19, and 21, it's a very interesting idea. Proverbs 29 Okay, in 
15, it says, The rod and her proof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. I, I think that's the greatest verse on church attendance more than anything. Okay, then 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest, yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. 19, A servant will not be corrected by words. Whoa. You ever see that in a job where somebody's new in a job and the one overseer over there starts yelling and screaming at them? Person won't listen to him. No relationship. Person will leave. They don't like the situation. He will not be corrected by words. For though he understand, he will not answer. What's the solution? 21. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child, shall have him become his son at the length. Gently guiding them. Gently guiding them. They will recognize, you care for me. I'm just not a number. I'm just not an employee. You care for me. They mess up. You say, okay, now we messed up here. This is how we'd like it done. Okay, we want to do it this way. You understand what we're doing here? We will forgive this mess up right here, but can we figure this out? That person, man, that person will say, okay, that's not normal. I usually get yelled at. And they'll have a different attitude because you're gentle with them. You're kind to them. You ever see a job where they have a continual turnover of workers? I guarantee there's a bully in there. Guarantee. You see, and this, this is the, the hierarchy is an amazing thing we learn in life. Now, there's a hierarchy in the Godhead, is there not? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. There's a hierarchy, but there's an equality where Jesus said the Father is greater than I, but then he's equal to the Father. Figure that out. And a lot of that's like in life. Sometimes you might be in a relationship, okay, for example, my wife taught piano, I was not her best student, in fact, I was probably her worst student, but yet, even in the play, when she conducts the play, I'm the sound man, I am under my wife. She's supposed to submit to you. Not in that case. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I submit to my wife. In the play, in the music of our church, because she's got more experience than I do. You see, that's the hierarchy. You figure that out, and you'll put yourself in a position, and you'll be a better witness to your family. Is it a brother or sister older than you? You got a different approach than a brother or sister younger than you. Different approach. Still, the idea is to serve them. Adult children should not be treated as little children. Right. Adult children are equal to the parents and should be treated as unique sovereigns. Grandparents should serve the parents of their grandchildren. You say, what if you see something wrong? Get on your knees and pray. Well, I'm going to give advice. Do you like it when somebody gives you advice when you're not asked? You know? I've had people give me their opinion. I say, hey, do me a favor. Write that on a 3 by 5 card and I'll give it to somebody who cares. Write all you know on that 3 by 5 card. Write legibly everything you know. And then I'll give it to somebody who cares. Because I really don't care. You see, unsought advice is seldom followed and usually resented. Isn't that how we feel? That golden rule is fascinating. Do unto others as you would have to be done unto you. Do you like if somebody yells and screams at you in the job? Okay, if you're over somebody, gently, delicately guide them. You'll be able to witness to them afterwards. You'll be able to tell them about Christ. Amen. 
I mentioned last night that I run a men's basketball league for over 30 years, and I've you know played basketball quite often, men in the community. But on the court, I compliment the other players, I compliment the other team. Guy burns me, he burns me. Man, that was a good shot. I'm gonna get you next time. But one of the men in town, his father died this last summer. And guess who he asked to preach it? And I got to preach a funeral, a gospel presentation to about 70 people who would have never asked me if I was a jerk on the court. They would have never asked. And the thing is, is do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. This is what leadership does. Now, if you're in a, in a bully situation and you can't get out of it, Daniel 1 gives a method of appeal where the response was good, fortunate. Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 gives a method of appeal where the response was unfortunate. But the ultimate is Romans 8.28 all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to the purpose. Now, the problem with our interpretation of that verse is because we've been raised on television. Usually, a problem starts at the beginning of the show, and amazingly, it's solved by the end. Yep. Right. That isn't life. Amen. Romans 8.28 is in the context of the judgment seat of Christ. You might be stuck in that situation until you hear the trump. Right. It just might happen. But when you love the Lord, it's going to work out at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. You pray for it in this life. But for every success story in this life, there's thousands of people who suffered. And that's where we yield to the Lord on those things. A biblical leader will use their position of authority for the best interest of others. Amen. Let's look at the Lord Jesus in John 15, 15. When he told his apostles he's getting ready to take off, he wants them to voluntarily continue the work. He's not going to bully them. He's not going to guilt them. John 15, 15, he said, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. Jesus Christ is your friend. When Paul described Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, he said, Meekness and gentleness. Right. Can you imagine that? Meekness and gentleness. If you would go to Acts 22. If Jesus was a manipulator, here's how he would have witnessed to Paul. So I can't believe that you were doing that to my children. You're so mean. You need to get right with God. If he was a bully, he would say, Saul, you dirty to, you know, punk you, uh, I'm going to throw you in hell. You deserve it, and I'm going to enjoy it. You know, because you're a heretic, and you're racist too. <laughs> what did he say to Saul? He said, how's your conscience? In Acts 22, now as, as an individual, we, there's, there's a time where we do... Remember our past faults, our sins, and it, and it eats at us. But if it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Acts 22, this is a perfect example. Saul was testifying in Acts 22. So I was just kind of reading through Acts here the other day. And it says in verse 7, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in a temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, but they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And so here's Saul appealing to, or Paul appealing to the Lord. He said, I said, Lord, uh, they know that I've imprisoned and beat every synagogue. 
uh, them that believed in thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was stoned, I, I, Lord, I was standing by, and you know I was consenting on his death. And I kept a raiment of them that slew him. Look at the Lord's reaction. Uh, uh, hey, I need you to do something. Forget that. It's gone. It's over with. He said, uh, depart, I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. It's like he didn't even say that. That's the forgiveness of God. I have a friend that you would not believe his testimony if you heard it. He was raised Catholic, became a witch. He became a Satanist. He became a vampire. I mean, all literal, all literal. Uh, he became a Mason. He studied the old Roman Catholic priesthood. And then he joined the Mormon church. And he moved up pretty quick because he knew all the secret handshakes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then a witch gave him one of Chick's publications about the rock stars, how they get the devils to, you know, bless their music. And he thought that was kind of funny. And that's how he got saved. Now, all of that past of him, the thing that I notice most is that he knows it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's done. And he's serving the Lord. When somebody goes that deep, they don't usually recover. But amazingly, this man is... It taught me a lot about spiritual warfare. Just ph phenomenal information. The method the Lord Jesus Christ draws men to himself. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That's the methods... That the Lord Jesus, why? Because this way you know if it's voluntary. I know how to make it, I know how to get people to pray a prayer. I know how to get them to do all that stuff. But it's got to be voluntary. You see, a bully does not experience voluntary friendship. I tell you, the greatest joy as a parent is when I can sit down and brainstorm and talk with my adult child about a Bible idea because they came to the same realization that I came to in two different avenues, not because Dad said so. This is all we know. It's how I was taught. They came up with God taught them. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. Amen. It's a great blessing when the dad and an adult child can discuss Bible. And we may not agree, but we have grace toward each other. Great joy. And that takes place through a voluntary relationship, almost kind of stepping back, letting them figure it out. I'm, I'm not discounting guidance as a parent and discipline as a parent. I'm not discounting that. That's vital. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, and a rod of correction will drive it far from them. But still, leadership, a leader creates a relationship that encourages others to want to voluntarily participate. Amen. Amen. That's what a leader does. And that's what the Lord expects from us. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to kind of get this idea, and I don't even know if I came and brought it in the right way, but Lord, uh, I just pray that you'd help us to do what we can to please you, and help us to, the majority of the time, be gentle as a lamb with our relationship with others. There are times, like you said, let our speech be always with grace, Seasoned with salt. There's that part. We have that. We're ready to do that when necessary. But grace 
is what you want us to experience more than anything. And Lord, I'm so grateful for your grace towards me. Thank you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.